Evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night weekly class on the Zera Shimshon. We'd like to welcome everybody joining us, all of our regulars, as well as our first times. Thank you for joining us. May Bezat Hashem the merit of Rabbi Shimshon Haim Nachmani, the author of the Sefer, the Holy Sefer that we're learning from. May he um, be in Shamaim and uh, Bezat Hashem fulfill all of the blessings that he does promise from learning in the book that we are reading. And um, only, only good things for us. Mizat Hashem, this evening's class, we are dedicating Lelu Nishmat to the elevation of the soul of our dear friend who perished today. Shaul ben Sarah Halevi. Shaul ben Nisim Halevi. And uh, may his soul be elevated to the highest places. Bezat Hashem. We're going to see that the first Dvar Torah that we're going to mention this evening, out of the two, is... Uh, unfortunately very connected to the concept of one passing away. As we know, Sarai Menu passes away in this week's parasha. I wanted to, before we get into the, the Zera Shimshon, I wanted to share with us from the Me'am Loez. I'm sure we've all heard of the Me'am Loez, Rabbi Yaakov Kuli, who uh, wrote a masterpiece on our Humash. He writes, and he says as follows, that we have to know very clearly, that the reason Sarah Imenu passes away now to a considerably untimely death was for one reason and one reason only, and that was because of the Akedat Yitzchak, Chazak Baruch, because of Abraham initiating and bringing Isaac and binding him and going to slaughter him in the name of God, obviously. Um... This is what the Mamluah says happened. It's obviously a Midrash. It's obviously not written in the Humash. You can't open in the Humash and find it. But the Mamluah says it, quotes it from a Midrash. The Midrash says as follows, that the Satan, the Yitzhara, the evil inclination, came to Sarah Imenu, obviously not with the greatest intentions. Again, he was the evil inclination, the Satan. And he comes to Sarai Menu disguised as an old man riding a camel. And he approaches her and tells her, Hey, you know what your husband's up to today? And she said, What? She said, the Satan tells, or the old man tells Sarai Menu, He took your son, Isaac, and he's going to slaughter him. Oh, really? She said, yeah. And she was so sad. And she started, look at the Midrash, it's so sad. It says that she was so sad, she was banging her head on the wall because she was so sad. And she was crying and so sad because of it. Again, we're talking decades of waiting for Isaac. So what did she do? She went and she looked around. Where? Let's go find my husband. I'm not going to believe this old man. I never met this old man. Let's go find this old man. So where did she go first? She went to, she first sent her messenger. She sent the slave, a messenger, to go look for, for Avram, couldn't find him. Then she went herself to the yeshiva of Shem Vever, where Avraham obviously hung out a lot. And any other places, and she couldn't find him. So what she did was she went to the three giants in Parashat Bereshit, the Torah speaks to us about these three giants. Now's not the time to get into that whole episode. However, the three giants, Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, all three of them, she approached and asked them, listen, you guys are so tall. Do you see anywhere an old man and three lads? Three lads? Why three? Well, we know, as we learned in last week's parasha, we had Avraham who brought Itzhak, brought Ishmael, and who else who was Abraham's sidekick? Eliezer, Chazaku Baruch. So the four of them. She, he said, do you see th an old man and three lads? So the giant said, we do. He's actually on a mountain, and he has, a, he has your son tied up on the altar, and a knife in hand. She heard that and she was in shock. All of a sudden the Satan appeared again and told her, you see, I wasn't lying to you. 
I told you where your husband was. And then the most interesting part of the Midrash, which I myself don't have cl pure clarity on, says that she died. I'll read you the words. When she heard these words, she died. But look at these words. Merov simha. Joy. Uh, because she was overwhelmed with joy. Huh? So it's a very, a very um, hard Midrash to understand because the beginning of the Midrash, she was so sad about the news. And then she, we would have seemingly said she cried herself to death. However, the Midrash says that she died because of overjoy. The explanation I thought of was, well, listen, she, she knew that her husband, that her husband was doing only the will of God. And maybe she understood that this was the 10th and final test. And finally, Abraham was fully committed to it. And she felt like that is the greatest simcha, but there's no, nothing left for me to live for. With that introduction, we're going to jump into this week's parasha because we said that the whole point, the whole reason why she died was because of the akidah. And then this week we come and then Abraham comes back from, to him, one of the greatest days, if not the greatest day of his life. Not only did he fulfill the will of God, but he passed that 10 test coming back with his son Isaac. What could be a greater day? But unfortunately, he came to a tragedy. And he came to something very hard. He came to his wife's death. And to that, the Zerah Shimshon quotes the Pasuk, and I'll read it to you. Vatamot Sarah. Sarah died. Now we have in brackets this Midrash to tell us exactly why and how. Bikiryat Arba, in Kirat Arba, which is in the district of Hebron, which is in the city, the, the land of Israel, Be'eretz Kinan. Now, Vayavo Avraham, Avraham comes, Lispod lesara Kota, to eulogize his wife Sarah and to cry for her. The Zerah Shimshon asks two very powerful questions. The first might be obvious to many of us. The second, maybe only if you would read these verses out of the Torah, would you pick up on? And I'll explain why. The first question he asks is, normally, when we hear the death of an individual, do we eulogize first or do we cry first? We cry first. You cry, you're sad, you eulogize, you cry some more. He asks, why is it say that Abraham comes back, finds his wife dead, eulogizes her, and then cries? A little weird. Lispod. Second question. Second question the Zerah Shimshon asks. If we open the Torah scroll and we look at this verse, there's something which is seemingly out of place. There are a couple times in our Torah that the letters are either bolded and bigger or smaller. Okay? This word, lif kota, velif kota, has a small chaf. Why would there be a small chaf, he asks. So these are the two questions he asks on this specific verse in this episode. Listen to what he says. He brings the Ma'varia book. The Ma'varia, the Ma'varia book was a, a, definitely a Kabbalist in his own, in his own right and is uh, an amazing, an amazing Talmud Chacham and author. He says, and this is something, it's, it's on one hand so sad to speak about, on the other hand so apropos to the passing of our dear friend from today, which was, which was devastating. Um, but it's, a, it's something that we have to remember, as we'll get to then when we tie it up again, for life. We have to prepare ourselves when we're strong and healthy for the hard times. Thank God now, no, no one in this room has a very recent loss. And if we do, at least, it, at least it's not like over us right this moment, like we cannot, cannot contain ourselves. So what we need to do is at these moments, we need to prepare ourselves for when it's going to be really, really hard. The Mavaria book says as follows. Do you know what the purpose of a eulogy is for? The purpose and the benefit of a eulogy is specifically for the benefit of the deceased. Okay, how so? He says that when the eulogizer, whether it be the rabbi or a family member or a friend, gets up and everybody starts crying, those tears help open up the gates of heaven 
and help the individual be brought up very fast and very high, right where he should or she should be. It's the tears of the close family and friends which unlock the gates of heaven. And what's the proof? We've learned in the Talmud that all gates have been closed. The gates of Torah, the gates of livelihood, the gates of happiness, all the gates of prayer. Everything has been closed. Now it's a gate, it's not an iron wall. So a little bit could seep out. We can grab a little bit of it. However, they're closed. One day a year, and specifically one very strong moment of the year, those gates are open. And that's by Ni'ilah, by the culmination of our Yom Kippur services, which is the strongest time of our year. Yes, we know that even all of Elul and all of that high holiday season is very strong, but there's no moment as close and as strong as Ni'ilah. However, the Talmud tells us that Sha'are Dim'a Lo Nin'alu the gates of tears were never locked. That means the gates which are holding back anything and everything in our lives, in heaven, as soon as one cries, they're able to unleash that blessing. Obviously a sincere cry. It's calling out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And to that the Madaria book says, the whole purpose of eulogizing the deceased is for the deceased's benefit. We know that it's also the benefit of all the listeners. It gives us encouragement. It gives us the will and the, and the hope to maybe do teshuvah, to repent. However, the very greatest part of the, of the, of the benefit is and goes specifically to the deceased. Can we please put phones on silent? Thank you. It wasn't you. Phones? There was a phone that's beeping twice. Kaddish is for the living, not for the dead. Kaddish is for the living, not for the dead. No, opposite. Kaddish is for the de deceased, as well as the eulogy is for the deceased. There's also a benefit for the living. By mere fact, one who has to recite Kaddish has to come to the synagogue to pray, and then they get involved, and so on and so forth. But the main, main uh, benefit of a eulogy, as well as Kaddish, are for the deceased. Now, the Ma'avariya book says one more thing the Zerah Shimshon brings, and he says something very interesting. He says that the greatest type and the most proper type of crying for a deceased is when we cry for, their, for the spiritual loss that is taking place over the physical loss. Meaning, the loss of this spiritual soul that is now lost, as I'll explain what that means, because that's very hard to understand, opposed to the loss of the, of the body. And the explanation is as follows. We all have relationships in our lives. We have friends, we have family. To, to, to some extent, there's definitely a physical relationship involved in each relationship, but it's very much more emotional. And the greatest of relationships even transcend to become spiritual. And the Mavaria book says the greatest way and the, 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 the type of crying one is supposed to cry for when they lose somebody is on the spiritual loss. Whether you want to call it that spiritual connection or that spiritual relationship that you are now losing here in this world, it's obviously not lost forever, but the one that you're losing here in this world, that's what you are supposed to cry for and not on the loss of the body of the person or the, the human being him or, her or herself. Understood? Based on this, bring a chair and come in. Based on this, the Zera Shimshon says something very powerful. He says, you know why, he answers the second question first. You know why there's a small chaf in Lif Kota? Because Abraham was holding himself back of doing a full cry on the spiritual and physical aspects as well. He was only crying on the fact of that spiritual loss that he lost his wife. That's why it's a small chaf. We got that? So why the mixing of order? Why the mixing of order? Listen to this. One answer he gives was the subject of the eulogy 
was her spiritual loss. And to that, crying is secondary. But he says something greater. Look at the, the second answer is beautiful. He says, human nature, human tendency, is that when this person loses a loved one and a close one, they cry. It's a natural emotion of losing somebody. <coughs> so Abraham, look at now he's adding something in the Zerashim Shon. Abraham, even though the Torah says first he eulogized his wife and then cried for her, really Abraham was a human being like all of us. And at the loss of his wife, he also cried. But the Torah didn't tell us about that crying. The Torah told us about the crying afterwards, which is something which is not always normal. Something which makes Abraham great for this reason as well as many other reasons that we know of. And that is, is that every time after the eulogy and the burial, every time after, he remembered the greatness and in light of what we said, the spiritual greatness of his wife, it brought his eyes to well up and tear. Forevermore. Anytime he thought of how great of a mother she was, how much sacrifice she sacrificed, how many people she helped bring in to Judaism along with her husband as the partner that she was. Anytime he thought of the spiritual achievements and the greatness now that he has lost to be his partner here in this world, his eyes welled up and he cried. And to that, the Torah tells us, first he eulogized. Of course he, he cried prior to that, that's normal. But he eulogized. And forevermore, every time he thought of her spiritual greatnesses and achievements, he also cried on account of that because now he was lacking her. To that, I wanted to maybe just remind us, because now we're thinking, okay, Abraham, you have a lot of imunah, you have a lot of trust and belief in God. Why is it so hard for you to, to part with your wife? Sachakol, you, you're, she's 127, you're 137. How, you know, be happy with what you got. So I want to remind everybody with what the Talmud tells us. That before a human being, and this goes equally for men and women, is created, they're, before they're even 40 days before conception, they are decided who they will marry. Now it obviously has to be 40 days before conception to the older one, right? Now, the way it works, and even though the Talmud doesn't use this verbiage, I like to always use it this way because it makes it very real in our, in our minds, is there's one soul, imagine it like a big matzah shmora. And what happens is, is uh, uh, God says, okay, he cracks it, says this half goes to Abraham, 10 years later, right, that was the H difference, takes the other side and throws it to Sarah. And they each grow up, and they each grow up in their own homes, in their own ways. And with the time, <clears throat> those severs are not the same way that they got left. Right? If you, if you crack a matzah, you could pretty much put it back together. It won't be perfect, but it's pretty much going to come back together. But if you wait 10, 20, 30 years, those cracks and those lines are no, no, no longer able to align perfectly as it was when it was just broken. And by the way, side note, we didn't need to get into that, but that's very often the, the natural cause for the friction there is in marriage, especially at the beginning of a marriage. Because what's happening is the soul, the single soul, is merging back together, yet it's not merging like this perfectly. It's trying to sometimes butt heads, not on every point, but on certain points, it's, it's, it's butting. And then it takes time to soothe and out, compromise on this side, compromise on that side, right? It doesn't mean to, to, to shave them down flat because then they're not going to be able to stick, right? There needs to be that teeth. There needs to be compromise on each side. So Abraham understood that they were one soul. Abraham and Sarah were one soul. There was a masculine side and a feminine side, and they had a common goal. And to him, to lose his wife, who was his partner in conquering the world for his, for his 
set mission was something which was so hard for him that not only was the eulogy enough, but every time after he remembered, not remembered, oh, how lonely I am. Oh, how nice it would be to have breakfast with her. No, no, no. Every time he remembered, not, not regretting and not wishing, not even wishing that she was here, but just thinking of this greatness that is lost, that it's not here anymore. All of those spiritual achievements. That's what he felt every time he remembered his wife. And that's a very, very strong lesson to us. The lesson that I took out this week from this first part of the Zer Shimshon is as follows. In life, we will come to these challenging moments. And as I previously said, we need to prepare ourselves for them. And a good way to prepare ourselves is to think, number one, how am I going to act when something, when a disaster as such happens? Two, how am I going to remember that person? Am I going to remember that person for their jokes? For their generosity? For their cooking? For their athletic capabilities? For their financial successes? What am I going to remember a person for? Whether it be one's parent, one's grandparent, one's friend, anybody. Number one, how are we going to act when it happens? And what is going to be the points that I remember? And we learned that from Abraham. How did he act? He was a human being. The Talmud says the first three days after a person passes away, we're talking about a karov, meaning, God forbid, a, 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 an immediate family member are destined and set aside to cry excessively and that's normal that's part of life we understand the whole mourning process to be a a diffusing detachment from the deceased the first three days the talmud says are the hardest days those are the days where there's constant crying the next seven days are days of eulogy post that then there's the 30 day period which is still heavy but less heavy than the seven days and then the year is still quite heavy but less than the previous layer. And then every year again, on the, on the anniversary of death, we are supposed to dedicate that day to, to doing extra things in memory of the deceased, as well as remembering them for their good. So how are we gonna act? Are we gonna cry on the physical loss? Or are we gonna cry for that spiritual loss that it, of course it's not lost it for et eternity. However, right now with my spiritual relationship that I'm living with in my world, I'm going to be lacking that individual. And that's something to be very sad for. That's number one. Number two, how are you going to remember the person? Look at Abraham. Abraham remembers his wife for all of those spiritual successes that now he's no longer able to pride with, to, to grow with, to succeed with. And therefore, that's what he is remembering about his wife forevermore. The, the loss of a spouse, I, I, I thank God, I don't I won't even open, could not even imagine, imagine what that's like. But I'll share with us, without mentioning names, a very sad story that happened recently. That there was a, a man, a father, a husband, who lost his wife, very young age. They were in their 40s. And I went to go visit him at his house. And what can you say? Four kids, they're both 40s, wife gone. And I just started bawling with him. And we were bawling together on each other's shoulders. It was horrible, it was so sad. And, and amongst the crying, I'm like, how are you going to do this? How are you going to continue? I told him, how are you, and maybe it wasn't even the right thing to say, but who knows when emotions, I told him, how are you going to go back to your bedroom and go to sleep alone at night? I told him, what's going to give you strength? And he told me, God is going to give me strength. He told me his wife is still with him. She's not physically here, but spiritually she is there with him. 
and I wish it upon nobody. We shouldn't even think of such thoughts. But the loss of a spouse, there's nothing which comes close to it. Even though we know that by the laws of mourning, the greatest level of mourning, which is the greatest obligation of mourning, is the loss of a parent. Meaning, uh, from child to parent, when an individual loses their parent, is the only case that one's obligated to recite Kaddish for all 12 months. For the loss of a spouse, the loss of a child, the loss of a sibling, all that's only one month. Nevertheless, and that, the reason for that is because Again, we owe everything to our parents. Our parents <laughs> did everything for us. <laughs> but as hard as it uh, to lose a parent, uh, thank God I don't know of any of them and, and we shouldn't know from any, none of us should know from any of them anytime soon. But it's a fact of life. <coughs> the loss of a spouse is definitely the hardest loss one can, can lose. And Abraham took it very, very, very s strong. It hurt him a lot. However, the commentaries explain what is it that he was exactly lacking? What was it exactly he was sad about? He wasn't sad about that physical loss. It was that spiritual loss that he was, that he was sad about. I once heard it very well, well put by a rabbi. Um, and we can all use this in our own ways as a coping mechanism to, to cope with such a hard situation. And that is, we have to understand that the loss of a friend or family member is equivalent to that of when you or them travel on a trip, move into a different country, and there's almost no physical communication anymore. Obviously not by touch and even by, by sight or even, or even with words. However, you don't cry hysterically every time you, you, you leave your family or your friends because you know you'll see them again. The same thing is when someone passes away. You might not know when the next time physically you'll see them, but if you have real belief in God, and you trust that everything is for the better, you understand that whether it be in the time of Mashiach or whether it be at the, the time of your, our own passing, we will reunite with them. So it's not a physical, it's kind of like a physical separation with an unknown date of, re, of, of returning. However, if we take it as right now, whoever it is is on vacation. We can't see them, we can't speak to them. It might be for a long time, but we know there will be a reunition again. I don't even know if that's word, a reuniting again. Reunion. Reunion, very good. Reunification. They will come back together again. And that's something which is sometimes very, very hard for us to understand. But in, our, in those times, as we said, that we're strong, we have to, to drill that into our heads so that when it comes, as hysterical as we may become, as le at least it won't be as hysterical as if it would be something, something worse. The loss of a child, God forbid, it, it's, it's something which is, unexp unexp we cannot explain that. There's no way that someone could come and give an answer for it. And therefore we always have to take it that God is sending it only for the good, as hard as it may be. And that we can't understand everything. We will never understand everything. We just have to wait for that day that everything in front of our eyes will be illuminated and, and, and given to us. That's this week's first Torah portion um, that, we are, that we are discussing. The second that the Zer Shimshon speaks about is the episode with Eliezer. Just to give a, a, um, a prelude, Sarah dies. And the same year, whether it was the same moment or not, is debatable. But the same time that Sarah passes away, a new biblical character in our Torah is born. And that is? Rivka. Very good, Rivka. Rivka was born at the same time that Sarah passes away. 
And three years later, when Isaac is now age 40, Abraham looks at Eliezer and commands him to go find a wife that is suitable for his son. Gave him criteria. Now this um, servant, faithful servant, came up with his own idea. He followed all the criteria, but he was thinking, how am I going to know which one's the right one? So he had, being the servant of Abraham, you definitely have belief in God. He knew God was going to send him. But he said, let me create some type of sign that I'll know who she is when she comes. And he came up with a sign that the girl or the woman who's going to offer not only him water, but initiate the offer as well to his camels, that will be the girl. That is her expressing and displaying her amazing, amazing upbringing and her midot, her great character traits of chesed, of loving kindness. So what happens? He comes and meets Rivka and Rivka does it. She offers it to him, the water, as well as to the camels. The Zer Shimshon asks, was it that he was waiting for a miracle? Was he waiting for this miracle to be that she's going to actually come and initiate? That's, that's kind of like, I'm predicting something to happen and if that happens, if that, again, it could have been a miracle that's going to actually make or break who my master's son's going to marry. Or better, he asks even better. He says, why would he even choose something towards the camels? Why didn't he say something like, the girl who offers me not only drink, but food and shelter will be the one. Why did he direct it towards those camels? Those camels are... Just, I guess, the, a means of transportation. Because if you can love an animal, that's a lower form. It's love, you know. Beautiful, beautiful. That's not his answer, but that's a beautiful answer. This, this is a very famous question. That's definitely one of the main answers. God beautiful, those camels beautiful. Go and drink somebody else's water or eat somebody. Oh, else's okay, grass. very good. It's him being a god. Very good, very good. So we have, we have a. Uh, I don't like to use the word, but I guess a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> because the books are available. <laughs> so listen to what he says. He brings the Midrash. The Midrash goes on to compare the animals of Abraham to the animals of another very famous character, however, not in our Bible, however, in the Talmud, Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair was a Talmudic scholar, um, and he had a donkey. And there are tales all along the Talmud with great things about Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair's hamor, that he was able to, to do. This animal knew when to eat from fruits and vegetables which were tithed versus not. Wow. They were able, he was able to discern. So the Midrash goes on and says that as great as these, it was like a question, were the animals, were these camels as great as the donkey of Rai Pinchas bin Yair? To which we're all going to ask, <laughs> Abraham compared to Rabbi Pinchas bin Yair, there's like a thousand five hundred years difference over there. What's the question? So the commentaries explain as follows. They say Abraham's own, if you'd like to use another word, stallion, that was definitely greater than Rabbi Pinchas bin Yair's own stallion. But the camels that belonged to his slaves. They were at a very high level, however, not at the level of Rabbi Pinchas bin Yair's own, own chamor. But the point of the Midrash is as follows, tells us that the camels of Abraham, all of his animals, even the camels that his slave took and went on, went, uh, went, to find, went on this journey to find uh, Yitzhak's wife, did not need to wear a muzzle. There was no need. The, every other one did. I'll give you uh, maybe a modern example. There's a law that you're not allowed to walk your dog without a leash unless it's in a designated and enclosed area. There was a law back then that your animal was not allowed to walk without being muzzled up. Because if it wasn't muzzled up, while it was walking, it peeked his head into this one's field and that one's batch and this one's shopping cart and eat from everybody. 
and it would just cause a lot of fighting and a disaster, everybody had to have a muzzle on their animals. Obviously in, in public domain and when traveling. However, the camels of Abraham did not need it. Really? Why not? Well, they were, the, 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 the Midrash tells us, they were the camels of a very righteous man and they knew not to eat what's not theirs. You couldn't bring them, this is the point, you couldn't bring them to eat what's not theirs. Oh, if that's the point, look what Eliezer decides to do. He says, if they won't eat or drink what's not theirs, then when the woman who even God does this offer and offers them water after me, they won't drink from it if that won't be the right match for Isaac. See how deep it is? <laughs> he says, they're so smart. They're so special of a caliber of a camel that even while offered something, if it's not the will of God, for them to take it, to eat it or drink it, they won't do it. And therefore, this is what he did. He made a rule. He said, if they're going to drink it, then I'm going to take that girl. He thought to himself, God will never let them drink from the girl that's not meant for Isaac. No Shudduchim resume is needed. <laughs> wow. So that's exactly... So now going back to our question, did he rely on a miracle? He did... He set this miraculous binding on these camels. However, it came from, from a, a, a fact, from a fact that these animals were special. <coughs> these animals were very special. And a lesson I took out from this is based on a question. I was discussing this with my very good friend, and we all know, oh, Chaim Hirsch, very good. We were discussing this and uh, he asked me, or I asked him, I don't even remember. We asked and we answered, we were, we were speaking together. And he, and he asked, why is it that Abraham's camels were super camel? Why were they special? So I, I, I told him, it could be one of two reasons. Even number one, the very actions of Abraham and his loving kindness and his righteousness rubbed off on his surroundings, not only on his family and his friends, but even on his means of transportation. That was one option. Another option is God gave him something that he deserved. He acted and always did at the most optimal manner, for a great, great way spreading God's will and God's word. So God gave him that gift that he had these super camels. Now, either way you look at it, it means that no good deed will go unpaid. It's also said on the opposite, but in, to end off in a, in a positive note, <laughs> when you do something good, when you radiate positivity, and optimism, those around you will absorb it and act as such. If God forbid you are leaving off and, and, and displaying negativity, pessimism, you're always down, complaining, that's exactly what your surrounding is going to be. We, we have to understand, we create our surroundings. We decide what goes on in our lives. We think good, good comes. We think bad and negativity, that will also come. Our minds have the great power and the great gift in many cases and also the greatest and the, our worst enemy to look at the exact same thing and draw completely opposite conclusions. And to that, the Torah is telling us Abraham had these, these camels. Very specifically, he deserved them. He deserved them based on the way he acted, whether it was more of a, of a physical, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, no, for, for like a physical transfer. 
that based, basically uh, osmosis, maybe, would be the word. Bas the, the way he acted, they picked up on it. Or because he did something good and he now merited it. And we have to always remember everything and anything we do is always going to be remembered. And that's why we always aspire to do the good. As parents, I think almost all of us in the room are our parents. It's probably both, right? That, that's why I wasn't going to say it's one or the other. But as parents, we have to, to know as, as employees, employers, as friends, as colleagues, and again, most importantly, as, as spouses and parents, we have to remember that if we are positive at home with our children, they will be secure and they will be positive. If we come home and we are screaming and yelling and we're a mess and we're disorganized and we're late and we're flustered, it gives the children the feeling that that's what life's about. Life's about, about, about only being confused and flustered and, and that brings them to not being very, what's the word? Um, what? Not only prepared, but uh, confident. For confident, very good, stable. Self-confidence, it ruins their self-confidence, it, 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 it distorts their, their, their stability, and that's something that we can do. We have the power, and most importantly, the mothers. The mothers are at home more with the children in most of the cases. As, and, 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 and as fathers, whenever we're home, we have to understand that we can demand, and more importantly, create an atmosphere at home. If we create that atmosphere of home, whatever it is that we will create, that's how the children will live all day long. The world is a scary place. The world is a rough and tough place. But if the children don't have a confident and stable place to come home to, then what do they, what do they have to look forward to? Who can they confide in? Who can they, who can they share their, their hardships and their struggles with? And therefore we have to remember that. So just as a, re as a quick recap, the idea of, of the loss of an individual, we need to prepare ourselves. How are we gonna act? How are we gonna remember them? And then this concept of, no, we don't rely on miracles. We can't rely on miracles. But Eliezer decided to make this tenai, this condition on these super camels. If they're gonna drink from the water, it had to be the right person. The camels themselves picked up on Abraham's sensitivities or the camels themselves were a special gift from God based on Abraham's actions. Either way, we have the power to be the best people that we possibly can be but the most important is, is part is that we decide, each and every one of us. We decide if we want to wake up in the morning. We decide if we want to pray. We decide if we want to sleep in. We decide if we want to give charity. We decide if we want to learn Torah. We decide if we want to do good things, if we want to do bad things, if we want to do nothing with our time. We decide to be productive or to be laid back and status quo. May God bless us with the words from Rabbi Shimshon Chaim Nachmani, the Zerah Shimshon. And again, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu elevate the soul of our beloved Shaul ben Sara Halevi. Tiyanish Matot Surah Amen. Please turn off.